Julie, thank you for that very uh, kind and uh, warm introduction. I'm always uh, happy to be with you folks in Minnesota. I wish it wasn't by Zoom this time. Uh, it would have been nice to be back with you physically, but uh, maybe that will happen in the future. Only the Lord knows. So do you have a date with Carbon-14? Let's take a look and see. Here is the outline of the talk. We'll go through these points. Uh, one by one, we'll start with the very basics. Well, I call it the particle playpen. Uh, how many times did I say it, Harold? How many times? Make sure that bomb shelter's got a can opener. Ain't much good without a can opener, I said. Well, we're gonna open the can of the atom and take a look and see what's inside and then use that then to explain how carbon-14 dating actually works. So here's a representation of the atom that uh, most of you folks are familiar with, but you may not remember the details from school. So it's the smallest unit of chemical element consisting of a nucleus and electrons. And electrons have a negative charge and they have negligible weight or mass. Uh, and they are um, outside the nucleus. We picture them as orbits often like the solar system, but it's not the way it works. They actually exist in areas that they call clouds. Uh, orbitals are actually the technical word. Um, where they're most likely to be found. But representations with um, solar system type depictions makes it much easier to keep track of what happens when uh, chemical reactions occur. In the nucleus are the neutrons, which have a neutral charge, neutron, neutral charge, no charge, and it has mass. And by definition, it's one atomic mass unit. And then protons have almost exactly the same mass as a neutron, but they have a positive charge. So the nucleus consists of the neutrons and the protons, um, which is where the weight or mass of the atom is occurred. And so the definition of the atomic mass is the total sum of the weight of the atom, the sum of the weight of the neutrons and the protons. And that sum is the atomic weight of that particular type of atom. The atomic number, on the other hand, is the number of protons. And that's what determines which element an atom is. The number of protons, that's the key. Remember that for sure. So an isotope, uh, the word comes from combining iso meaning same and tope meaning place the same place. So isotopes refer to the variants of the same kind of element that have different numbers of neutrons. Remember, for it to be the type of element it is, the, the protons determine that. So isotopes have to have the same number of protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons. So some are stable and some are not stable. Uh, looking at carbon, carbon-12, the most common form of carbon, uh, is stable. Carbon-13, the next most common, is also stable. It's carbon-14 that is not stable, and we'll talk more about that. Molecules, then, are combinations of atoms, and the one everybody is familiar with uh, most is uh, water, and it looks like Mickey Mouse here in this depiction with the uh, two hydrogens uh, sharing electrons with the oxygen atom. It's the electrons that form the bonds that hold the individual atoms together to form the molecules. So here's the, the student. He said, I thought you said the chemical composition of water was H2O. So here you see the periodic table, and so I have a white box around carbon to highlight that it is atom with six protons, therefore it is element number six, and the isotopes all have six protons. So here you see showing carbon 12, 13, and 14. They all have six protons, but they have different numbers of neutrons meaning six, seven, and eight neutrons. So the atomic mass, six neutrons plus six protons would be 12. 
seven neutrons and six protons, 13, eight neutrons and six protons, carbon 14. And that's the one that is not stable. It is unstable. It is radioactive, meaning unstable. Notice the percentages, so the makeup. So carbon 12 is nearly 99%, not quite. Carbon 13 is almost all of the remainder. And then carbon 14 is an extremely minuscule amount. One in, in 10 to the 12th, meaning trillion, one in one trillion carbon atoms is a carbon 14 atom. That's a very, very tiny, tiny number. But that's the one we're going to be focusing on. Well, what, there are three different types of radiation uh, relating to the decay of carbon-14. Um, an alpha particle consists of two protons and two neutrons, so it has an atomic mass of four. And I'm going to just show you a representation of a small part of the uranium nucleus. So the, the number on top there, 238, refers to the sum total of the number of protons plus neutrons to make the total number for the atomic mass or atomic weight. 92 refers to the number of protons. And that's what determines the fact that this particular atom is uranium. So uranium undergoes decay in 16 stages, but we're just going to talk about one step, and that's alpha decay, which occurs eight times. And so you see they're highlighted in this oval, two protons and two neutrons. So they kick out of the nucleus, and that is now an independent alpha particle. So that's alpha decay. That's one of the main means of decay of the nucleus of an atom. Well, since it's lost two protons, its atomic number is now 90 instead of 92, so it's no longer uranium, it's now thorium. Okay, so that's how an element changes what it is, is by the changing the number of protons. So there you see uh, a portion of the periodic table, so that atom of uranium upon decay has become thorium as it lost the alpha particle, two protons and two neutrons. Well, these alpha particles just don't sit there on their lonesome. They pick up stray electrons and become helium. So helium is a byproduct of the decay of uranium. So when one uranium atom decays, all the way down to lead, in the process, it gives off eight alpha particles, and therefore they become eight atoms of helium. There's a reason why I'm introducing this while talking about carbon. We'll get back to that later on. The second type of radiation is called a beta particle, and it is basically an electron, which means it has almost no mass, it has energy. In beta decay, a neutron highlighted by the uh, circle there decomposes, decays into a proton and a beta particle, which is basically an electron. So what you see that was circled uh, was a blue neutron is now a new red proton. So that also changes what the element is by altering the number of protons. So it changed from having 90 protons to 91 upon the decay of that neutron. So the beta particle kicks out, it has that negative charge and almost no mass, and that neutron has become a proton, so now that is protactinium. And so there you see there, where thorium became protactinium. This is beta decay. Julie, are you with me? All right, very good. The third type of radiation is purely energy. 
gamma radiation. And this is the type that kills. This is what's so dangerous when Chernobyl occurs or the Fukushima plant in uh, Japan or getting too much radiation in a medical setting such as the x-ray suite. So I'm representing this with this very, very short wave, high energy a representation of an energy wave, pure wave. And that is what gamma rays consist of. So as we look at the electromagnetic spectrum, on the right hand side are extremely large, long waves of low energy. And the slowest there, radio waves, it goes through as you get up to faster and faster uh, wavelength, shorter wavelength, goes through microwaves, which we use for our ovens to heat up our food, or infrared to track things at night. There's visible light, very tiny amount of the spectrum. Ultraviolet, uh, which we use to kill bacteria, for example, to sterilize things medically uh, for surgical suites that can't be heated, such as rubber tubing. Then x-rays we use to take for, you know, looking at egg for bones and other parts of the body. And then gamma rays, the highest energy of all. So these are the things that, that are, are the most dangerous and are produced um, upon decay of atoms. So looking at all of them together, uh, we have for alpha decay, it has the positive charge, two protons. Beta decay has the electron, one electron negative charge. And gamma has no charge, it's pure energy. The speed of light uh, or fraction thereof for an alpha particle, it's 80% of the speed of light. Uh, the beta is 99% of the speed of light and gamma is light. It's a photon, it's the speed of light, it's energy. So this is uh, showing how we can identify them, relate them to the alpha particle being the nucleus of, an, of a helium atom. <coughs> Excuse me the uh, beta an electron, and gamma a light photon. Now, how to protect ourselves? The alpha particle can be stopped with a few inches of air. It's not dangerous. The beta particle, a few sheets of paper or thin metal foil, like aluminum foil. It's the gamma rays. Those take inches or feet of lead. So that's the puppy that is bad news. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> so now let's take a look at this concept of nuclear half-life. In other words, how long does it take for the half of the number of atoms that are of a particular radioactive type to decay, to fall apart? How long does it take half of them to fall apart? Well, um, using uh, methods of measuring this and being able to extrapolate things, because obviously we can't watch something for 5,730 years to determine, but using certain uh, equations, they're able to, in a shorter period of time, figure out how long it takes for half of the material. So I'm using uh, a pi as a way to illustrate this, that for carbon-14 specifically, um, after 5,730 years, half of the original amount of the number of atoms of carbon-14 will have decayed. In that next 5,730 years, half of the half will have decayed so that only a quarter of the original amount is left. And so as we keep slicing the pie every 5,730 years, goes down, to a eighth, to a sixteenth, to a thirty-second, sixty-fourth, and then it becomes so small that it's no longer measurable. Now understand that there's this asterisk at the word no longer measurable. I, 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 at the risk of repeating myself too many times, I'm just going to put that, to avoid that risk, I'm putting the asterisk there to say, all of these numbers are using the evolutionary assumptions of uniformitarianism and long ages. So understand that it's that context for these numbers of years. 
and we'll talk a lot more about that. But just every time you see me or hear me talking about these huge numbers, understand that this is all out of the evolutionary uniformitarian time frame interpretation of things. So um, don't think I'm talking about actual number of years. Hey, cartoon equations. Do you enjoy your job as a cartoonist here, Kazel? All right. So let's focus. Let's talk about how carbon fourteen is formed and decays. So here you see a representation of the Earth and its uh, magnetic field, shielding it. And solar radiation strikes the atmosphere and produces carbon fourteen. Now, folks who have medical background know that the atmosphere is 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen. So that's why when we talk about keep the patient on room air, we're talking about 21% oxygen as opposed to supplementing with uh, higher amounts from an oxygen source. So the solar wind, uh, referring to this radiation that's coming at us uh, from the sun, uh, is uh, to a good degree, shielded by this magnetic field. So what happens in the upper reaches of the atmosphere, the stratosphere, is that these nitrogen atoms, comprising 78% of the air, are struck by these very high energy um, waves coming, ions coming from the sun. And here's just showing you that 99.63% of nitrogen is nitrogen 14 as opposed to a different isotope. And as I already showed you, carbon 12 is 98.89% of all carbon. So here's what happens for the formation of carbon 14. The neutrons are being kicked around in those very high energy um, situations up there high in the stratosphere. And the neutron collides with a nitrogen atom. And so think of like a billiards table where you break, break the formation with the cue ball and it sticks to the group of uh, pool balls, billiard balls, and but some of them break out. So this is what happens here. So the neutron strikes the nitrogen nucleus. It sticks and a proton is kicked out. By the force of the neutron striking the nucleus. So that is how nitrogen is converted into carbon 14. So the total mass is the same. The nitrogen has seven neutrons and seven protons, but the carbon has eight neutrons and six protons. So that's how nitrogen 14 becomes carbon 14. Are we good? All right. So here it's showing then the nitrogen becoming carbon. Same total mass, but a difference in the number of protons. So again, this is one in a trillion carbon atoms of all carbon. So in the atmosphere, this is occurring. Carbon-14 is formed, combines with oxygen in the atmosphere, forms carbon dioxide, that contains carbon-14 rather than carbon-12. So plants take in the carbon-14, becomes part of the structure of the plant. Animals eat the plant. We eat the plants. We eat the animals that eat the plants. So that's how we get carbon-14 into our bodies, as long as we're alive. Well, photosynthesis is the miracle that makes it happen. So inside the leaves, inside the cells, there are these very tiny special structures called chloroplasts. And chloro, by the way, means green. Chlorophyll means green leaf. 
That's the name of the molecule that takes the energy from the sun and converts it uh, into um, uh, energy stored in electrons that can be used then to make sugars. So the plant takes in water from the ground, takes in the carbon dioxide with carbon-14 from the air, and most everybody had to learn this formula when they were in school. So six uh, molecules of carbon dioxide plus six of water are converted into six of uh, oxygen molecules and one molecule of sugar, which now contains carbon-14. So that's how we end up with carbon-14 in our bodies. So during life, there's equilibrium with the atmosphere, with the plants, the animals, and people. That we all have the same ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 in our organisms while we're still alive. But once an organism dies, there is no further acquisition of carbon-14, but there is loss by the decay of the carbon-14 back to nitrogen. So it's this loss which is used to make an attempt to determine how long something has been dead. So here is how the carbon-14 decay occurs. So here's the carbon-14 atom with its six protons and the eight blue neutrons. That neutron decays, as I showed you before, <clears throat> beta decay. And there you see it turning red and green to represent what's going to be the new proton and the new electron or beta particle. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> and then poof, it occurs. And so now what was the neutron is now the new proton. The beta particle slash electron has been kicked out. And so that was formerly carbon-14 is now nitrogen-14. The carbon has decayed back to nitrogen. So this is what happens. It happens even while we're alive, but we're in equilibrium because while we're alive, we still get new carbon-14 that is the same ratio as what we lose. Okay? <coughs> so the carbon has reverted back to nitrogen. So how is this measured? Now, folks don't really talk about this too much. There's two main methods. The original method <clears throat> was actually counting the decay of the carbon-14 atoms, the beta decay, as it occurred using a Geiger counter-like device. So this would be done for a period of a couple days and then using the mathematical formulas, an age, uh, an age would be determined, or a ratio would be determined, and then an age would be determined. So this is more cumbersome, takes uh, longer, and is not quite as accurate, not as accurate as uh, the other method I'm going to show you. So the limit to how old something can be dated, again, the asterisk means using the evolutionary assumptions, the uniformitarian assumptions, would be about 50,000 years. After that, the amount of carbon-14 remaining in the specimen would be so small that it would not be measurable. So here, just showing you using the pi again, that after 60,000 years, no longer measurable. It's there, but very, very tiny amount. The other um, newer method, it's been around for decades, but it's the newer method, is using an accelerator mass spectrometer. So here's this huge device, uh, the one in the lab at the University, uh, University of Arizona in Tucson. And this uses a tremendously powerful electromagnetic field. Uh, that's three mega electron volts, as in million. It takes a huge amount of power. Well, 
excuse me, the first the sample has to be prepared so before it gets put into the uh, device for measure uh, for measuring. So there's the use of like a, a pair of forceps here to physically pick out foreign objects because, for example, um, we have to remember the flood was a giant washing machine and everything got mixed together. And, and things happened since then. So, for example, when I was on the dinosaur dig in Montana seven years ago, uh, excavating a triceratops horn and the cervical condyle, the ball at the top of the neck, roots were growing, growing into the horn. There are pieces of uh, tortoise shell right there. There are bacteria, mold, all these things have to be dealt with. Um, the products of freezing in the winter and then roasting in the summer, all this kind of stuff has to be dealt with. So objects that are large enough to be seen with the visible eye, naked eye, are removed with forceps and then use a scalpel to scrape things uh, off the surface. And then if it's, for example, a bone specimen, then a dental drill is used to erode away the very top part of the surface so that chemical and other physical contaminants are removed so that we're getting pure specimen. So these are things that have to be done to the specimen. So if it's charcoal, wood, um, uh, peat, and text, most peat, types of peat, and textiles, the chemical preparation after the physical preparation is hot hydrochloric acid, followed by a base, sodium hydroxide, and then repeat with the hydrochloric acid that's at normal room temperature. So those are the steps for preparing these types of specimens. For bone, it's cold hydrochloric acid, then the sodium hydroxide, the base, and then a repeat with uh, the acid, and then the collagen is exposed. So that, that is really what is being used, because remember that bone is a, a double matrix. It's a protein matrix, and collagen is the main protein but it's also a mineral matrix of what's called hydroxyapatite, calcium and phosphate and oxygen. So um, the collagen is therefore then exposed and then that is what is uh, measured for carbon in the bone specimens. And then for shells, coral and other carbonate materials, uh, it's the, uh, acid itself <clears throat> and that's all that's needed. So the sample now is further prepared by um, using a laser source to put intense energy to carbonize the specimen so that the carbon atoms then form sheets, planar sheets, which we call graphite, which you see here on the bottom of the slide these parallel sheets where the carbon atoms are, are bonded, covalently bonded by electrons in the plane, um, but other very uh, weaker forces, very weak forces are what hold the sheets together. This is why when you use a pencil, which we <laughs> still mistakenly call a lead pencil, it's actually graphite, when you write and strike your pencil against the paper, you're rubbing off these sheets of graphite, these planar molecular sheets. So this is the preparation so that this is the condition the carbon will be in when it's inserted into the accelerator mass uh, spectrometer. So Luke, use the mass times the acceleration. Okay, in other words, that's the formula for force. Mass times acceleration is force. Use the force loop. So this accelerator mass spectrometer, as I said, has this huge 3 million electron volts of power to generate this incredibly strong electromagnetic field. So the specimen is carbonized and then turned into graphite specimen is put into the place where it's loaded and it's bombarded 
with ions <clears throat> from cesium, which is a heavier element, number 55. And I show this in relationship to xenon. This shows it has one more proton and one more electron than xenon. And you may remember that the xenon being a one of the noble gases, noble elements, uh, their electron orbits are full, they're happy, they're satisfied, they don't normally interact with other atoms. And that's put under extremely abnormal conditions, which are not natural. So cesium in that position has this extra electron, it's very happy to donate, that's the point of that. And so the cesium atoms then are used to bombard electrons onto the specimen, the carbonized graphite specimen, in this very strong electromagnetic field, the carbon 12, 13, and 14 atoms are sorted out because of their different weight, the different mass. Having that extra neutron or two extra neutrons makes all the difference in the world in this device so that the heavier <coughs> ones, carbon 14, go the furthest. Carbon 13 in the middle, and then carbon 12 is the first one. You see where it says carbon 12 cup, carbon 13 cup, and carbon 14 cup. Well, this bombardment by the electrons from the cesium causes all these various different forms of carbon atoms uh, to occur as a result of the bombardment, and then they fly through this field and are sorted out. Now, <clears throat> you would think, that the heavier one would be the first one to leave. Well, the way it works, it's because of the attraction uh, by the uh, magnetic force, electromagnetic force is what causes the heaviest one to go the furthest. So these, these species of carbon atoms go through what's called an electron stripper so that they only have a positive charge and carbon-14 having the greatest Uh, positive charge goes the furthest. What are the advantages of the accelerator mass spectrometer? And a much, much, much smaller sample size is needed. Tremendously smaller sample size, which is important because sometimes samples are uh, not readily available. Especially if it's something like a blood spatter uh, for forensics, uh, or um, a, a nut, a single nut, like an almond, or a few small tiny seeds. It's very fast, only a few hours are needed, instead of taking days, and it's more precise. So these are three great advantages for the uh, accelerator mass spectrometer spectrophotometer. And theoretically, you could date things up to 95,000 years, again, with the asterisk talking about the uniformitarian assumptions. However, in practice, the limit is still about 60,000 years. The great disadvantage is higher cost, and the second disadvantage is a greater risk of contamination. So the Technicians have to be very, very careful not to allow contamination to occur. I would, thought I would throw in, what does it cost to do this just for the fun of it? Because I didn't know myself. And you can see that uh, for the person who's not part of the university itself, <clears throat> uh, a commercial uh, submission, it's uh, $460 uh, at the max. Uh, for the uh, charcoal, the solid stuff. For something dissolved, it's uh, even more expensive. And then for the nonprofits, academics, museums, it's a medium price in there. Well, what are the underlying assumptions? And this is very important to understand because if you understand these underlying assumptions, you'll see how this system cannot be relied upon to give good, accurate, meaningful dates. So there are three basic uniformitarian evolutionary assumptions. I use the U word, uh, meaning uniformitarianism. And that refers to the doctrine of evolution 
that all physical processes have always been occurring at the same rate at which we observe them today, in the past without change, unvarying. That assumption is necessary for this method of dating. So that the ratio of carbon-14 to carbon-12 has always been the same in the past. And we're going to show that that's not the case. An example here is uh, in uh, Siberia. Fortunately, in an unpopulated area uh, 122 years ago, a uh, meteor exploded in the lower atmosphere, wiping out hundreds of square miles of forest. This picture was taken 20 years after, no, 12 years after the event, showing that the forest was turned into matchsticks. Well, wood samples obtained from that location and then comparing them to wood samples uh, from other locations around the world and using the ability to uh, date um, tree rings uh, by counting the rings shows that the amount of carbon uh, 14 in the atmosphere was greatly altered for the next uh, two to three years uh, worldwide. So this shows that indeed the ratio of carbon-12 to carbon-14 is not constant and has not been constant. This is one example. Another category of examples is volcanic eruptions. They shoot tremendous amount of stuff into the atmosphere and alter the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14. Well, there's something else that can change the ratio as well. So remember that we talked about where carbon-14 is formed, that it's high in the atmosphere and the stratosphere. Well, the magnetic field of the planet has been decaying since the planet was created a little over 6,000 years ago. And the weakening of that magnetic field alters the rate of carbon-14 formation. So here's a diagram uh, showing uh, the uh, approximation of the history of weakening of the magnetic field of the planet, that during the flood, there were tremendous uh, changes and reversals, but that the overall curve is an exponential curve. And without exception, all magnetic field decay events have always been shown to occur in an exponential fashion, never, never, never linear. So every time someone unplugs an electric motor, the magnetic field decay, um, generated by that motor decays in an exponential curve, just like this. So therefore, it's um, reasonable and accurate to extrapolate the magnetic uh, decay curve backwards uh, in time uh, from the data that we have since 1830 to the present. Well, another factor that shows the rate of formation of carbon-14 in the atmosphere can change um, is an event that was occurring in 774-775 AD. Um, much higher uh, amounts of carbon-14, and that is uh, speculated to have been either a supernova in relatively close proximity to the planet or a solar event, a coronal ejection event, um, altering the amount of carbon-14 formed. So we know there are several different examples, several different methods by which um, the ratio of carbon-12 to 14 is altered in the atmosphere and it is not constant. So this first assumption is not a valid assumption. Well, there are other things as well. And the verse I'm putting up here out of Genesis chapter 6 
refers to God becoming so unhappy with the level of wickedness and evil that was occurring at that time that he judged the earth and flooded it. So water certainly can wash things in and out of specimens and alter the ratio of carbon 12 and 14 in a specimen as well. So the flood is certainly a major factor that of course the secular scientists do not allow for or take into account. And I'm taking a moment here to plug in my computer because I forgot to do so. I don't want it to come <laughs> out on me while we do this. Okay. So God said, I will wipe man off the face of the earth. And indeed he did. Only the survivors on the ark. So we have to take into account that this would alter things as well. And just for a tidbit of information, this painting is by the Russian painter Ivan Ivazovsky, who specialized in seascapes. So I thought this is a great way to visualize the severity of the flood, wiping out people. And as I said already, the not only the secular evolutionists, but the theistic evolutionists also deny a global Genesis flood. And this is another aspect of uniformitarianism. And of course, the purpose of the flood was to judge the phenomenal level of sin at the time. But the, one of the results then was carbon being taken out of circulation. So um, it's thought that the great majority of the planet's surface was land rather than water, maybe the reverse of what it is today. And that the huge amount of biomass was fantastically greater than today. And we know this simply because of all of the um, products of burial from the flood that were produced, taking all of that carbon out of circulation. And so an inventory was done showing these uh, categories of where carbon is located, whether it be in the atmosphere, um, soil and plant products or animal products that are in the soil, uh, wood, vegetation, but of great interest are the layers of the ocean and then precipitates, referring to things such as uh, carbon uh, carbonates in rock, such as limestone, for example, um, but also petroleum, natural gas, these types of things. Now, these numbers here you see are units. One unit is a billion tons of carbon. So where it says carbonate precipitates, and you see that number there of 20 million, that's 20 million times nine, uh, times a, a billion tons, tons. <laughs> Unbelievable amounts of carbon taken out and put into rock or oil or gas. So we see these various forms of carbon that were once part of living organisms. Marble being uh, limestone that was uh, trans metamorphosed by pressure and heat. Graphite, which we've already talked about. Calcite, as well as oil and gas. And uh, things like methane and, and carbon dioxide that are in, trapped in the crust. As well as coal and diamonds. So this event by the flood tremendously had to alter the ratio of carbon-12 and carbon-14, very different than, than now. The second assumption is that the original amount of the parent element was 100% in the specimen, and the original amount of the daughter element was 0% of the specimen. That's the second assumption of the carbon-14 dating process, or any radioactive dating process, whether it be uranium, to lead, or whichever. But no one can know this. What was the original ratio in the specimen when it was formed? 
For as God said in Job 38, 4, were you there when I laid down the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. <clears throat> so the obvious answer is no, we were not. So there's no way to know this. This assumption has no basis. As in early chemists describing the first dirt molecule here. The third assumption that this is a da uh, dating system is based upon, the rate of radioactive decay has always been the same, unchanging as what we measure today. The rate of radioactive decay. So here is a way of picturing this uh, using the hourglass analogy with the rate being determined by the neck of the hourglass, so that the radioactive parent atoms, in this case, carbon-14, go through the decay half every 5,730 years at today's measured rate, and then the daughter atoms being nitrogen-14. Um, I have to talk a little bit about what was done in the RATE project, Radioactivity and the Age of the Earth, done by ICR and the Creation Research Society, <clears throat> published almost 20 years ago. And they did very elegant experiments with zero assumptions, only experimental data, empirical data, no assumptions. And so they took these uh, specimens uh, that uh, were in zircon crystals that had uranium atoms. And in that particular crystal setup, it was possible due to chemical and electrical properties to determine that all of the uranium in those specimens were indeed there at the formation of the crystals and that subsequent uranium could not enter the crystals once formed. And same with lead, that all of the lead there was as a result only of decay and not entering later. So in that particular very special situation, they were able to measure the amount of uranium, measure the amount of lead, measure the amount of decay, and come up with the actual rate of decay. And since I mentioned earlier that helium is the byproduct of the decay of uranium to lead, they were able to measure also the amount of helium and the rate at which helium leaks out of these crystals. To give you the short version of this, they were able to demonstrate that the actual age of these specimens was about 6,000 years plus or minus 2,000 years. So maximum age, 8,000, minimum age, 4,000. But yet, one and a half billion years worth of decay occurred of the decay of the uranium. So what this means is this huge amount of decay occurred in a very short period of time. Huge amount of decay, little amount of time. So this means that the assumption of a constant rate of decay is totally false. And that the rate of decay had to have been greatly, greatly accelerated in the past. So billions of years worth of decay in only 6,000 years. So this, in and, and this case, you can use the word prove Often we cannot, but in this case, you can use the word that it has been proven that the rate of decay in the past has not been constant and has been greatly accelerated in the past. And this would apply to all elements, to all forms of radioactivity, whether it be uranium, carbon, potassium, strontium, whatever, thorium, plutonium. And so, just to reinforce that this is the case, helium is still in those zircon crystals because there's not been enough time for it to, to, to diffuse out, to leak out. So billions of years worth of decay 
in only a short period of time. And billions of years worth of helium is not found in the atmosphere. So acceleration of nuclear decay of all types. So you're doing cave drawings with carbon sticks. A thousand years from now, archaeologists will go ape trying to date these suckers. <laughs> Uh, okay, coal, diamonds, carbon dioxide, and methane. Now, most everybody talks about coal and diamonds. I only came across one person who talked about carbon dioxide and methane, and we'll go over that. <clears throat> so the types of samples we talked about earlier in, in terms of the preparation. So we'll focus on these four, coal, diamonds, carbon dioxide, and methane. Well, the evolutionary story is that coal formation happens with very slow accumulation of organic material as trees fall over in the swamp and they're in the water. And they take thousands of years to decay and then they take zillions and millions and billions of years to get covered and then be compressed into coal. That's the story we've been fed over the years. But there are many problems with this, and one of the most outstanding, to make a pun here, are these trees that are standing out in vertical positions, extending through rock layers that are supposedly thousands of years of age. And so you have to ask the question, how did that tree stand there dead, waiting thousands of years to be buried without decomposing, or without being eaten by termites or microorganisms? And the answer is that's not possible. These trees had to be buried catastrophically, compressing these thousands of years into one event. So the supposed time frame for the formation of coal, according to the uniformitarian folks, the secular folks, is around 3 billion to 3.6 billion years ago. That's what they publish. Well, that's a long time. That certainly is a lot more than 60,000 years. So should there be any carbon-14 in coal today, according to the evolutionists? And the answer is a big no, a really big fat no. Well, the folks in the rate project uh, went to the U.S. Federal Coal Bank at Penn State University, where the specimens from different coal mines from around the country are stored in an argon atmosphere, so that there's no oxygen, so the oxygen won't oxidize and interact with the coal. Remember, he said that the noble gases are inert; they don't react with other elements under normal conditions. So these were great specimens to be able to. Um, examine and see if there's any real carbon-14. So this was done by the Ray Project, and indeed measurable amounts of carbon-14 were found in all of the specimens, no matter what their supposed conventional age or location. And this is not supposed to be, because these things are supposed to be you know, 3 billion or greater uh, years of age, uh, or tens of millions of years of age. Well, okay, so the evolutionists say, all right, well, coal is soft, so maybe something leached stuff in and out and caused a change in the ratio, so therefore we don't consider this valid. <clears throat> so, so, okay, fine, let's do diamonds, the hardest known natural substance to man. And diamond formation, how did it happen? Well, in the crust of the earth, which is about 30 miles thick or so. So there's the gray representing the crust. And we have these zones here with these crustal plates moving around today about an inch, roughly an inch a year. Um, but we know that it was much faster in the past during the flood process. Well, as a result of these joints between the crust, there are these places that we have tremendous volcanic and earthquake activity, the ring of fire around the Pacific Ocean, for example. But there are places elsewhere where 
material was shot up rather quickly. They estimate at 20 to 30 kilometers per hour, you know, roughly 15 to uh, 20 or so miles per hour. That's fast for rock to move. And uh, the diamonds formed in the depths and then were shot up towards the surface. How long ago? Well, ac according to the evolutionists, a billion to 3.3 billion. You know, I, I misspoke earlier when I was talking about the uh, coal formation. I should have said million, 300, 350 million years. I said billion by mistake. Um, so here, a billion to 3.3 billion years ago for coal, uh, for diamond formation is, is how they see it. Well, I just point out, just a reminder that this huge span of time was compressed into one year by the flood. Just to give you that we're not buying into the evolutionary time frame that indeed the Earth is really only a little over 6,000 years old. And in yellow, you see the countries where diamonds are found. To me, it's interesting that there are two bands north or south of the equator. Um, I don't know why, but I just note that. So these very beautiful, precious, expensive gemstone quality diamonds were not used for the experiment. Instead, these industrial grade diamonds, as you can see are small and cheap, uh, were used. So should there be any carbon-14 in diamond, according, in, signal lost. according to uh, evolution? And again, if they're supposed to be billions of years old, the answer again is a big fat no. Well, measurements show indeed in all of the specimens from different locations that indeed every specimen has measurable amounts of carbon-14. They again cannot be these long ages, these old ages. They have to be less than, using evolutionary assumptions, less than 60,000 years. Well, I'd like to talk about the work of John Dowdy of New Mexico, who is no longer with us, he's with the Lord now. But the Arizona Origin Science Association had him come and speak to us uh, several years ago. And uh, his own work on carbon dioxide and methane from wells, gas wells, or from coal beds. Um, so these various locations you see here, with the red and blue markers, indicate the coal mines or the gas wells from which he obtained his specimens. And he had them submitted to the University of Arizona lab, the one I showed you there. And the results of these specimens here, it's showing the conventional ages of tens or hundreds of millions of years uh, for these uh, supposed ages for these uh, specimen locations. And the first slide here is for carbon dioxide, and this slide is for his methane samples obtained from the uh, coal beds. And showing uh, what was, uh, again, what was found with the coal and diamonds uh, by the work of ICR and CRS, uh, translating to somewhere between 44,000 and 57,000 years. Again, uniformitarian assumptions. Here is the result of John Dowdy's work for the methane and the carbon dioxide. Again, significant measured amounts of carbon-14 and their ages translating into between 27,000 and almost 50,000 years based on the several uniformitarian assumptions. So whether it be coal, diamonds, methane or carbon dioxide, all of them have carbon-14. None of them should if they were as old as the evolutionists tell us. This is a test. For 30 seconds, this station will conduct a test of the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> well, there will be a test on what I've told you as well. And here's where it becomes very interesting is to apply 
and talk about the effect of decay of carbon-14 in living organisms. We can bring this down to how does this relate to us personally? Well, um, they're finding out more and more as they actually open their eyes and look at stuff that the percentage of fossils, whether it be dinosaur or other critters, and the percentage of the specimens is very highly organic material, soft tissue, non-mineralized. Amazing, especially if you assume it's millions and billions of years old. Okay, this is very hard to read, but this is a listing. I just want to make the point. This is a listing of the significant number of dinosaur specimens that have been submitted and indeed have carbon-14 measured in them. And the ages range, um, but roughly between 20 and 37,000 years, which is again, totally breaking the evolutionary time frame, even though it's older than what the biblical time frame is. But again, even those ages are still using those evolutionary assumptions. Well, um, here is a paper. So I'm going to blow up the title and blow up uh, some of the actual numbers so you can easily read it. So the title is a comparison of Delta 13, carbon 13, and percent modern carbon values for 10 Cretaceous Jurassic dinosaur bones from Texas to Alaska, USA, China, and Europe. So I took part of the text here and blew it up. And so here's the quote here, which translates to apparent ages of 22,000 years for calcium carbonate in the Psittacosaurus which means parrot lizard, as it has a parrot-shaped head, from the Gobi Desert in China, to 39,000 years for calcium uh, carbonate in Triceratops from Montana. So these just absolutely destroy the evolutionary time frame. Well, what about amber? I had the university librarian scour the literature and we could find very, very few articles relating to carbon-14 and amber. In fact, you could only find uh, two articles that really said much at all. And one of them uh, had this data that uh, the quote calibrated calendar age, and we'll talk about calibration, showed that this one specimen dates uh, to 775 to 472 in that range uh, before Christ. And then the other specimen they had uh, were able to measure um, somewhere around 1400 AD. And then they said the other specimen for, uh, that they had in wood uh, contained no measurable carbon-14. Uh, they didn't speculate on why, whether the specimen size or uh, things happening to it or um, actual age. Of course, if it has none measurable, then that means it's supposed to be uh, older than 60,000 years. Well, other living organisms, uh, shells from snails were dated, uh, kill, the kill the animal, submit the shell, and it's 27,000 years old, even though it's only a couple days old. <coughs> And I gave the, the citation for that from science. The amazing thing is this published in Science, a very evolutionary oriented journal. How about killing a seal and measuring it? It's uh, 1300 years old. Now, I put here this attempt to explain this away by this evolution uh, website. This is the well-known reservoir effect that occurs with animals that live in water. It happens when, quote, old carbon is introduced into the water. Old carbon is present from a deep uh, ocean water and doesn't have any measurable carbon-14. Okay, that's what they're saying. And so, um, of course, that explanation doesn't really, to make a bad pun, hold water. All right. 
Um, something that's rarely talked about is plants' preferences. Plants have preferences as to which carbon they prefer, 12, 13, or 14. Okay, most of you may recognize this cartoon character, Calvin. Well, I put that there because the Calvin cycle is the means by which plants incorporate carbon from carbon dioxide in the air into sh sugar molecules that they manufacture. And there's three different mechanisms, three different systems for doing this. One is called C3 because it deals with three carbon molecules, molecules that contain three carbon atoms. So without going through the gory details, that's the point, is, is this, type, this type of plant, car carbon uh, C3 plants, incorporating these three carbon molecules to make the six carbon glucose, sugar molecule. These are examples of C3 plants, wheat, rice, cotton, and sunflowers. There's another called C4 metabolism, in which a four carbon molecule is used and two carbon atoms are added to it to make the six carbon atom uh, molecule, uh, glucose. And this type of uh, plant grows in hotter and drier climates. And instead of all of the work of synthesis being done in one type of cell, it's the work is split into two types of cells so that the carbon dioxide is concentrated in one cell and in the work of photosynthesis, the Calvin cycle is done in the other kind of cell. These are C4 plants. And this just shows the anatomy of the leaf uh, where you see the uh, vertical green cells, long cells, those are the uh, palisade cells. <clears throat> those are the work, cells where the work of uh, photosynthesis takes place. So these types of plants, C4 plants, are corn, uh, sorghum, uh, sugarcane, and it's a type of plant, I think, called armentum. The third type is, are called CAM, C-A-M, CAM plants, Crassulacean acid metabolism. And these are plants that are in extreme hot, dry climates, such as the central valleys of Arizona, the deserts, and their pores in their leaves, through which carbon dioxide is taken, need to stay closed in the daytime so the plant doesn't dry out and die. But yet photosynthesis needs to take place during the daytime. So these plants separate the acquisition of carbon dioxide uh, from the work of photosynthesis in time. In the C4 plants, they were separated in space, two different kinds of cells. In these CAM plants, they're separated in time. So the CO2 is taken in at night, and then photosynthesis is taken in by day. They use this mechanism to store the CO2 in the plant until photosynthesis occurs. So these are the pores that you see. They're called stoma, plural stomata. That's where the oxygen is given out and the CO2 is taken in. So those they keep closed during the daytime to preserve loss of water, prevent loss of water. What amazes me uh, is how people know this stuff in great detail, the, the botanists, and yet they somehow still think it's evolved. It just killed me. So here are some of the plants, <coughs> pineapple, uh, many types of cactus, agave, which are not cactus, they're a, a type of succulent. Cactus have wooden skeletons, but succulents do not. <clears throat> and orchids, these are all cam plants. So here's the comparison, the point of all this, is these three different types of plant systems have different preferences for carbon-14. Now, how significant this is in terms of affecting the dating of a plant specimen from the past is not agreed upon. 
some of the folks think it's more significant, some think it's less significant, but it's just another factor that people never hear about, and I thought would be interesting. So here's a very different, but very big question. Here you have carbon-14 and nitrogen-14. What happens to that carbon-14 in your DNA when it decays? Because this happens. Over a lifetime, around 50 billion decay events occur in your DNA. Aren't you thrilled to know that? Exciting, yes? Yes, exciting, but maybe not in a positive way. Well, here's a reminder of the structure of DNA, and just to show you that all of those places where you don't see an O or an N or a P, it's carbon. Plus the places where you see, a P, see the letter C, it's also carbon. So when one of those carbon atoms is carbon-14 and it becomes nitrogen, Let's just say that's not a good thing. <clears throat> it can cause the molecules to fall apart. You can get breaks in your chromosomes. You get mutations. It's all bad news. Okay, so you have breaking of the strands occurring in the in the backbone on the side. You can have mutations of the bases on the inside. Bad news. Bad news. Bad news. Well, here's another thing that is interesting. So we're talking about organic molecules other than DNA. Now, uh, some of you may actually be taking nicotinic acid. Um, you know it probably more by the name niacin, which is vitamin B3, which is used to help reduce cholesterol levels. So here are the two forms. This comes in more than one form. This form has a, an amine group substituting for the hydroxyl group, the amine group in yellow. And it is part of the structure of this much larger molecule called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. Well, that big long name means it has a big important job. This molecule is what carries electrons from the breakdown of sugar molecules to the part of the cell where those, the energy from those electrons is used to make your ATP, the fuel, for all of the biomedical, uh, biochemical reactions in your bodies. Not all, but most of them. ATP, that's the coin of energy. Well, a very interesting thing that I came across was this article um, done in uh, 1966 in the Soviet Union. And the title is Doklad Akademi Nauka SSSR, Yul August, Tisyach Deviat Sotshestasyat Siam Godu. So this is a report done on the effect of the decay of nicotine with carbon 14 in it. Nicotine, nicotinamide the NAD molecule, and it has a bad effect on the ability for the molecule to do its job of carrying those electrons so the ATP can be made so that you can fuel the reactions to make your proteins. Aren't you happy to know this? So there are real reasons to have concern about carbon-14 in our bodies. Well, what about carbon-14 during the flood? As we showed earlier that sometime in the past, the amount of radio decay was phenomenally greater than measured today. And many creationists think that this occurred during the flood year. Um, that's a subject of intense investigation, and that's a whole nother talk. That we'll leave that alone, but it's very reasonable to think that a tremendous amount of decay was occurring during the flood. And I bring this up because this is most likely the reason why the decrease in the age spans of the patriarchs. 
Now, there's a lot of other factors that may or may not have contributed to this decrease, such as changes in oxygen content in the atmosphere, uh, increased uh, radiation, uh, other various, I mean, um, weakening of the uh, magnetic field of the planet and other factors. But it seems that the greatest single most significant factor is genetic decay. And so this business of decay of carbon-14 may very well be the mechanism for that genetic decay, as well as the fact that the flood created a tremendous, the world's most outstanding example of a genetic bottleneck from maybe many millions, maybe even a few billion people prior to the flood to eight people. So I think genetics are really the, the main mechanism here and the decay of carbon-14 may very well be a significant factor in that because as you see here noah actually outlived two of his like six times great and eight times great grandsons so tremendous decrease in longevity and the blue line marks the flood No more, no more. I can't take it. That is that's nothing sound, folks. Other considerations. Okay, I mentioned earlier calibration. Well, the evolutionists recognize that there are these problems with the assumptions of constant ratio of carbon fourteen to carbon twelve, and they try to compensate for them. So that's what they mean by calibration. And so, since carbon thirteen is stable, not radioactive. Uh, they use this as a means of trying to compensate for some of these things that make their assumptions um, not uh, about, uh, not reliable. So they use uh, different things to try to set up these standards uh, for calibration to allow for the variance in uh, differences with the ratios. So wood is what they selected as a standard material. And there, this shows the, how there is variation, even in <clears throat> what are considered um, as remote as possible locations. So Mount Mauna Loa being a very, very tall peak in uh, Hawaii. So in terms of atmosphere, it's way, way up there. And it's in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. So greatly isolated, not totally, but greatly isolated from the effects of what's going on on the mainland. Uh, showing these changes here in the uh, distribution of the carbon-13. And also, it's the same thing that's going on in various oceans with uh, corals and other um, aquatic organisms in the oceans, as well as in atmospheric C CO2. They're seeing decrease in carbon-13 as well. So they're showing that, indeed, these ratios um, are not constant. So they, they talk about here about this flux, this exchange of carbon pools with atmosphere, with the different levels of the ocean, including the very deep levels, and stuff washing in to the oceans from the land through the rivers. Uh, so there's all these variations of things that, that make things not constant. And again, volcanoes, as we mentioned before, having very big upsets and ratios. So another um, thing is regarding the beta detection method as opposed to the accelerator mass spectrophotometer is trying to develop a standard for that. Now they use 1950 as a standard year. And so when they talk about calendar years, they're talking from 1950 for their ages. But what I don't really understand is, is they selected wood from 1890. And the reason I don't understand that is they say to eliminate the effect of fossil fuels, you know, burning coal and oil and things for industrial activity. And my question is why 1890? Because the onset of the Industrial Revolution was in the 
you know, around 1760 and the Industrial Revolution was pretty much complete by uh, 1830. And that's why I put this picture of the railroad here, because the railroads made their debuts in uh, 1830. Why they didn't pick an earlier year for the wood, I don't know. For the accelerator mass spectrometer, uh, they used uh, a batch of oxalic acid uh, made in 1955, <clears throat> and then they had to adjust it. And the reason is the nuclear testing in the atmosphere that was going on in the, in the 1950s, altering ratios once again. So in 1977, they made a second standard, uh, which is now in wide use uh, from French Beats, to try and compensate. They're trying to calibrate to compensate for these problems that cause the inconsistency and falsity of those assumptions we talked about. So here is showing the effect of the atomic bomb testing in the atmosphere with uh, tremendous change with. Uh, the uh, carbon ratios. Well, they also say that they can distinguish biosynthesized, meaning natural materials from man-made materials that contain carbon. But it goes back to their assumptions. So here showing examples of plants and animals being the biogenic, biosynthesized materials, meaning remains of plants or animals, versus things made from fossils. And here you see their assumption that the fossil fuels have carbon-14 decaying below detectable limits, in other words, non-detectable. But remember what we showed you with the work of the Ray Project, that indeed fossil fuels have measurable carbon-14. So this is a very false statement. And so this ability to distinguish biosynthesized from man-made materials is not true. It's, it's, it's not legitimate. And this is, this, these sentences here are quotes from Wikipedia. There's another thing called the Seuss effect. And this deals again with this assumption that the fossil fuels, including carbon dioxide, uh, from the gas wells contain no measurable carbon-14, but I showed you with the work of John Dowdy that that is not true. This is false information. Well, okay, so one of the things they try to say, well, okay, it's contamination, it's contamination in your specimens. Well, not true. So here's the quiz I told you that was coming. So I, I can't hear your answers, so you're just going to have to shout to the walls. Okay, so after how many years using the evolutionary assumptions, should there be no measurable carbon-14? And I, maybe I could read Julie's lips, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> okay, I think she said 80,000, 60,000. We'll take that range. Being generous, being very generous. Rocks and fossils hosed to be older than a sage should be carbon-14. Julie? Free or dead? Okay, but I need to see the lips move. Okay, but carbon-14 is found everywhere, she says. Indeed, this is true. So initially, this was attributed to contamination, she says, and, but we now know with more aggressive investigation that the carbon-14 is inherent, it's real, it belongs, it's actual, not contamination. So I have a last very big question for you. Remember that we said that carbon-14 is formed in the atmosphere, high up in the stratosphere. Diamonds are formed, very deep in crust and thrust upward. So how in the world did that carbon-14 get into those diamonds? Ah. Well, 
Well, I think you have to invoke the flood and the burial of tremendous amounts of organic material, plant material, and the conversion with heat and pressure to diamonds. I don't think there's any other way to explain carbon-14 in diamonds. Okay, the last item, spiritual decay and renewal. Out of Exodus, for in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. We're talking six normal 24-hour type days, not any long ages. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. And this was from the beginning, no long time, no uh, evolution from some pre-existing animal directly from the elements, from the dirt. That's why Adam is named Adam. It means earth. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of the fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So we really can't blame Eve. We have to blame Adam because he was responsible. God is the one who gave him the instruction not to eat of the fruit. And he just stood by while she did it. Oh, okay. So um, Adam is responsible and I can't really jump on him because I'm sure I would have made the same mistake. First Corinthians, for since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so even in Christ all shall be made alive. So thanks to God's plan laid down before the foundation of the earth, Christ was designated to be that perfect sinless sacrifice on the cross to pay for my sins and everybody else's so that we could be saved if we have the faith and act upon it. The Holy Spirit. So cast your burdens on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. So in this very interesting time that we live in with this uh, virus business, a lot of people, I think, are being terribly, terribly um, messed up. Jobs being lost, businesses being lost, you know, people dying. People losing hope. So this is a great time for us to take advantage of the stillness, the enforced quietness, to talk with folks, to give them the truth of the Lord. And we are to do this uh, as we are not taken captive through hollow and deceptive uh, philosophy which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than Christ. That is the perfect definition of evolution. It couldn't be better said. Use our God-given brains. Be renewed in our mind. I have a question with the rate program. Um, yes. It's been some 20 years almost. What are, what are the evolutionists saying about that rate program? Well, at first they tried to say it was contamination and that was killed. Then they tried to say that the um, helium was trapped in the uh, biotite surrounding the zircons. And then the work was shown that the rate of diffusion out of the biotite was 20 times or 200 times faster than out of the zircon crystals themselves, so that didn't hold water. So then they turn to what they do with every other subject is, GPS signal lost. is that they um, get mad, call you names, say bad things, or ignore you, or change the subject. <laughs> okay, so we see where they're really at then. <laughs> yeah. Very frustrated, very frustrated with the results. Yeah. You know, I have to tell you of an ex of a experience I had last summer when my wife and I were in uh, Iceland after my teaching time in uh, Ukraine. We went through a lava tube cave, a very large one, very extensive and long one. 
And our guide was an English geology graduate student, uh, Shark Gal. And so, and I asked various questions during the tour. She says, oh, are you a geologist? By the quality of the questions I asked, I said, oh no, definitely not. But I know some stuff. So after the tour, she uh, was gracious enough to uh, give me the time to uh, talk with her as an individual and was able to bring up the business of uh, what we talked about today in terms of using these things to date rocks, for example. No, not carbon, but uranium and other things, same process. And I explained that to her in, in condensed form. And she was so excited. She said, I've never heard this before. This is great. I said, listen to me carefully. When you go back at the end of the summer to your graduate school, you're going to have to be extremely cautious who you talk about this with, or else they will kick you out of the program and you will not get your degree. And she said, but it's all about the truth. I said, no, it's not. I said, it's about protecting the paradigm, about protecting the evolutionary model so that people can continue to be steered away from God. And I'm happy to say that we've had further um, communication since then, and she gets it. Great. So, yeah. So. Um, you have to be on guard when you're in those settings. Yes, you do. Does anybody have any questions at all? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yes, we yes. can, Jean. Yeah. Yes. Um, I understand the idea of half-life is expressed in years, and right. those are more years than we believe the world has uh, existed. Right. But the idea being how quickly uh, 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 radiate uh, things decay, how can it only decay half amount? I mean, wouldn't the decay rate be the same throughout its entire decay rate existence? Why does it only decay half, half the amount? Okay, uh, I think I get your question. Um, I think it's actually two questions. Okay, the one, one part of the question, answer is, excuse me, <coughs> is the accelerated amount of uh, speed of the decay, rate of decay, caused billions of years of worth of decay at today's rates to occur in extremely short periods of time, maybe even just uh, the year of the flood. Now, the other part of the question, why does half only do it at a time? It's not that half of it does it at a time. It's that, it's that they pick half of the amount decaying to be a measurable time interval. Oh. The, the decay is occurring throughout the time, but they, different molecules, atoms do it at different times, so they pick the time at which half of it happens to be a way to be able to compare and measure everything. Oh. Does that thank make sense? You. Yeah, thank you. Okay. okay, very good. Good question, great question. Anybody else have any more questions? Hey, Gene Hodel, do you have any question? I got a quick one, Julie, can you hear me? Yes. Um, as, as far as carbon dating, did they do a lot of that for on dinosaur bones? I'm not sure. Well, um, in general, in general, the evolutionists don't because they don't believe it's uh, um, young enough to have measurable carbon 14. Right. But it has been done. Uh, matter of fact, there were some secular scientists who did it and had a paper written and prepared to speak, present this at a conference in southeastern Asia some years ago, uh, and the initial submission of the abstract was accepted and printed in the program, but once they read, actually read the more detail, the people organizing it uh, did not permit them to present at the conference. <laughs> wow. Wow. 
and, and nobody else has done it since then? Or, or well, that you, you know, this is expensive stuff. Right, right. And uh, well, I showed that one slide, which you couldn't read, that there were some 20 specimens that had been submitted, and they all have measurable carbon-14. OK. Anybody else have a question? I had just a, a comment. Sure. Um, could it be that the uh, rate of decay didn't speed up during the flood, but at the time of creation, the rate of decay, the resonance of atoms, the speed of light was near infinite, and that that has been decreasing uh, by the square, not linearly, uh, since the time of creation? Well, that's a matter of debate. There's not agreement about that, and I can't really speak to that because that's way beyond me. Um, but not, not all the creationists agree about that. That's all I can say about that. Something else for more research. Yeah, yeah exactly. I do have what? a question, if you don't mind. Go ahead, Gary. Um, with the production of carbon-14 in the upper atmosphere, uh, the, the um, creation model that you gave for that was a neutron hitting a nitrogen-14. Uh, that's not a creation model. That's Everyone uh, agrees that's how yeah, it happens. Yeah, it's a secular model. OK. I, <laughs> sorry, I used the wrong term on that. Um, but with the uh, change in the Earth's magnetic field, does that change the rate of production of carbon-14? Yes, that's a point I was trying to make, yes. Okay, well, here's my confusion on that. <laughs> and my confusion is that um, neutrons are not affected by magnetic fields. But it's not uh, at least just... I thought. I, I could be wrong on that, but that's... Um, it's well, okay. It's not. It, you're right. But it's not just. It's the. It's the deflection of the incoming energy. That's the point. It's the deflection of the incoming energy, and it's that incoming energy which is what causes the neutrons to bounce around. 